This episode is sponsored by italki, a very convenient way to build your fluency in English by getting regular spoken practice into your life with one-to-one lessons or conversations on Skype. They have lots of teachers just waiting to talk to you, and when you get some talking time, italki will send you a voucher worth a free lesson. To get that offer, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash talk or click an italki logo on my website. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, you, and you, and you, and you, and everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm recording this on a very windy Tuesday morning. A storm passed by uh, over the last few days, wreaking havoc across the UK. And also here in France, we've had some pretty strong winds and it's still very blustery out there. But here I am in the cosy confines of the podcastle at LEP headquarters, a pre-lunch recording of this introduction today. I hope you're comfortable. Let's get started. So recently, I was contacted by a listener called Inner with a suggestion for the podcast. The message went like this. Hi, Luke. I'm Inner, one of your regular listeners, as well as a premium subscriber. I'd like to thank you for your podcast, which is always helpful and always interesting. I'd like to talk to you about my teacher, Sherwood Fleming. Her blog is SherwoodFleming.com. She is teaching me how to communicate better in English as a foreign language. Her lessons changed my vision of what communication is and helped me to understand how to communicate better, not only with my foreign colleagues, but how to communicate better tout court, meaning sort of full stop, how to communicate uh, full stop. Some of my colleagues had the chance to work with her and it was a kind of a revelation for all of them every single time. I strongly believe that this topic would be very useful to all of your listeners. So I got in touch with Sherwood and arranged a call for an interview. And that's what you're going to hear on the podcast today. So here's some intel on Sherwood Fleming from her website. So Sherwood's expertise is in, imp- is in improving the written and spoken communications of those who use English as a second language and work within intercultural business contexts. She's designed and led seminars for more than 25 years in both Canada and France, helping thousands of participants to communicate more effectively. Sherwood is the creator of the five five-step clear method, which has established a new standard for expressing opinions interculturally. It forms the heart of her recent book, Dance of Opinions, Mastering Written and Spoken Communication for Intercultural Business Using English as a Second Language, an easy-to-learn and apply method for intermediate and advanced ESL business people designed to improve how they express their opinions. Her motto is, we build our futures together in the words we exchange today. Okay, so this conversation is all about the, it's all about intercultural communication. What are the issues and obstacles that we face when communicating with people from different cultures? How do our different approaches to communication uh, influence uh, the relationships that we build with people? What are the solutions to some of the problems that can arise when communicating across cultures? Sherwood talks about finding strategies to help you learn to dance to the same tune as the people you're talking to. And this involves things like uh, the pragmatics of looking beyond the words that are being used towards the real intentions of communicative acts. Uh, There are some examples of people in business contexts and also how I sometimes struggle with intercultural communication in my everyday life in France. So our aim for this episode is to help you, the listeners, attain clarity about these issues that you may not even be fully aware of. And once you can see more clearly what these issues are, then you'll be ready to apply the proven solutions which Sherwood shares during this episode and in her other work, including her book, Dance of opinion available on Amazon. So let's now listen to Sherwood Fleming and you can consider these questions. So what are the typical problems people experience when communicating across cultures? Can you find some examples? What are some of the reasons behind these problems and what are some solutions that we can apply to those problematic situations? I'll chat with you again briefly at the end and I'll be reading out some listener comments that I've received recently. But now let's get started.
Hello, Sherwood. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks. How are you, Luke? I'm very well, thank you very much. You're down in the south of France, aren't you? Yes, exactly. I live close to Cannes, where the film festival is. That's where most people know where it is, based on that. Yeah, it's very nice down there. Yeah, the weather's wonderful. Not like in Paris, where you are today. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, today we've got beautiful uh, clear blue sky. Uh, a beautiful clear okay. blue sky. It's exactly my favourite kind of weather. Clear blue, a bit chilly. It's perfect for me. Mm-hmm. But I suppose Great. it's yeah. probably the same thing over there, isn't it? Blue sky, sunshine, yeah, but a bit warmer. Yeah. Always. Yeah, yeah, really? pretty much always. As it's about 16 down here today. Oh, sounds amazing. That's, <laughs> that's great. So um, where do you come from originally? I'm Canadian originally, and that's why I appreciate warm weather and sun, because in <laughs> Canada we can get around this time it's about minus 40 where I, in Toronto where I once lived. So, uh, so I prefer to be here. Wow, minus 40. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing about Canada, isn't it? Because it's such an appealing place and a fantastic place to live. And then you think, oh, but the winter. It's yeah, crazy. exactly. Yeah. And you don't. So I don't know. I personally don't think I could ever do it again. I wonder how I did it for some, most of my life. Really? Wow. It's that bad then. It's, it's that difficult, is it? Well, you don't think that when you're there. You know, it's like anything. Whatever you're used to seems like normal. And then it's the same with like intercultural communication, you know, when you in your own country speaking your own language with your own people, it all seems really normal. And then suddenly you're in a different context and you go, ah, this is now the new normal. So it takes some adaptation and sometimes it's good adaptation and sometimes it's not so good. <laughs> I can imagine it would be almost impossible to go from living in the south of France to going back to minus 40 degrees in Canada again. I think, yeah, I think that would be too much of an adaptation. At I this think point. so. <laughs> All right, so you're so you're originally Canadian and uh, from Toronto, then. Mm-hmm, that's right. Okay, so do you have the accent? Do you have a kind of first of all? Do you have a Canadian accent and do you have a Toronto accent? Is that the right word, Toronto? Yeah. It is. Well, accent is an interesting phenomenon because that uh, goes back to the the idea of norm. I mean, to me, I don't have an accent. To your ear, I have an accent. Right. And vice versa. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I think so. It, it's an interesting. Phenomena that accent lives in the ears of the listener, not in the speaker. Uh huh. So um, that's an interesting phenomenon for your listeners because often people will say to me, uh, "Yeah, but my accent in English is bad." And I say, "Yeah, but who's listening?" Mm. You know, if it's a Russian person hearing your and you're French and you're using English, how does the Russian hear your accent differently than I do, or than you do, or than another French person does? So that's one of the aspects, too, that a lot of people are concerned about whether or not they have an accent, when in fact, from my standpoint, as long as the accent doesn't impede understanding, mm. there is no accent. <laughs> right. So people don't need to be as conscious of, about their accents, because that's what I find a lot. People are very self-conscious about what accent they have. Certainly learners of English are. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I make the point, because... It's something that I think people need to understand that there is no right accent. Is your accent the right accent or is mine? You yeah, know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. there is no right or wrong. It's just different. And so when you ask me the question, is it Canadian and is it Torontonian? Yeah, I would say, yeah, because we say our A's, we pronounce our A, a a little bit differently than other Anglophones. And also we tend to articulate more than Americans do. Yeah, it's interesting. Maybe, yeah, not as much as the British, but a lot more than Americans. So yeah. that's why we're easier to understand typically with people who use English as a second language. I suppose it depends which British people you're talking to though, because uh, I know plenty of Brits in certain parts of the country who don't really articulate, not in the way, not in the conventional way anyway. Okay. So for our, our, our learners of English, they're often concerned about what accent they should have. And uh, yeah, the main thing is that as long as they're clear, it doesn't really matter. And if they sound a bit, let's say yeah, exactly. if they sound a bit French, yeah. that's all right. Cause they are French. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so I say that to your listeners, because I know there's a lot of them out there who are thinking, oh, God, if I could only improve my English accent, everything would be better. But really, it's from my perspective, working with people from multiple cultures every day in a lot of different contexts, accent is really irrelevant. Mm. You have the accent you have. At a certain age, you can't change it very much. 
Right. So it's kind of a useless effort to try and focus on something that's really not open to change. So I prefer to have people to focus on things that they can change. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. So um, what do you do then, Sherwood? Well, what I do is uh, I, the, the, I use a phrase that my clients often say to me. Like often when I work with clients, they say, well, after working with you, I'm a lot clearer and more confident when using English in an intercultural context, working with people from other cultures. So what I do is create clear and confident intercultural communicators wow. because that's something that most of us don't know how to do okay. because communication at a certain level is transparent to us. We don't observe that we're using language. We're on kind of autopilot. Mm -hmm. And because we're on autopilot, we can run into some difficulties uh, when the autopilot doesn't work. So I help people really identify what's not working and why. What do you mean by the autopilot? Well, one of the things is that we all function on what I call cultural autopilot. Mm. So what I mean by that is that if I asked you, where did you learn to communicate? What would you answer? I'd probably say at school or at home when I was a child. Yeah, and but did you learn to communicate or did you learn to speak and li and write and read? Mm, yeah, I don't know. I, I suppose I learned to communicate uh, just at home with my with my mum or my brother or my dad, just like like getting yeah, getting things I wanted. And yeah, exactly. We learned to speak, but we didn't. Most of us didn't really listen. Or didn't actually ever learn how, any communication skills. Um, so when that's one of the first questions I always ask my clients, where did you learn to communicate? And their answer is always, well, yeah, I can speak and read and write, but really I never learned any communication skills. And when I say to them, well, where did you learn to communicate across cultures? Well, the same answer, nowhere. <laughs> so you're living in Paris now. Where did somebody teach you to communicate with the French? Uh, yeah, no one. Nobody I mean, did. They, they tried to teach me at school, but yeah, no uh, they, they failed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the language. <laughs> Yeah, so you can use the language, but does that mean you really know how to communicate with the French? That's and so to me, language skills and communication skills are quite distinct. And so what we all do is we function on autopilot in the sense that we have no skills in terms of communication or intercultural communication. So we're just communicating the way we learn to communicate in our own culture and in our own, own language. And we don't even know what that is. So, so, so if somebody, I was going to say, sorry, what's the difference then between uh, communication and using language? Well, the difference is that it would be like saying, well, can you drive? I mean, anybody can get behind a wheel mm -hmm. and kind of move the car and perhaps avoid objects. <laughs> uh, but if you have but if you actually want to, you know, be able to be safe and not kill other people and not get into accidents, you have to learn a certain set of skills. Okay. Communication is the same thing as somebody. I've been working in the communication field for 30 years. I can tell you there's a lot of communication models and a lot of skills that people can learn that really help improve not only work but life. I mean, one of the things I say that if fundamentally I do and I've been doing for 30 years is I show people how to solve problems in their life and get more out of what they want from life by learning how to adapt how they communicate. Right. And that's a surprising for most people to hear because usually we want to solve a problem or improve our lives and we don't imagine that how we communicate has anything to do with it. But think about it. What do we all do every waking minute of every day? We are communicating with others or with ourselves. So communication has a lot to do with our life. And uh, so that within an intercultural context, how we function in that context has a lot to do with how we communicate. So I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my clients a few years ago was the HSBC Bank in Monaco. And every month they have a conference call, 30 people, 18 different cultures. So their corporate culture is English is the official language. So everybody was speaking English, mm. but they weren't speaking the same English because everybody was speaking English in their own tonality, their own cultural style, their own cultural form and body language. And they were using English words. So the confusion arises because 
the words are the same, but you are interpreting all of those other things, and it creates a lot of confusion and miscommunication. So, you know, you'll often hear people say, well, I have no problem when I speak English with people from my culture who are also speaking English. Mm. And why do you think that's so? Because in that moment, we can interpret the tone, we can interpret the form, we can interpret the style, we can interpret the body language. So we're actually interpreting all of that that gives meaning to what we're hearing, you see? Mm. Mm. So really... Culture is a perspective of, of speaking and listening. We don't realize that our cultures speak through us, and I like to say we listen with cultural ears. Mm. So that's what I mean by autopilot, is that we are really cultural beings. We think of ourselves as psychological beings, but we're actually cultural beings. And we don't realize that much of what we say and how we say it and how we hear things has been conditioned. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So it's not just language, but it's also about the way we use language. And there are certain cultural codes that define the way that we communicate and the way that we interpret what other people are saying. And so, yes, if it's French people... And we're not even aware of it. Yeah, and we're not even aware of it, you see? I see. I mean, what I'm saying right now is something most of us are not aware of. It just happens. That's why I call it autopilot. Yeah. Because it's just happening to us and we don't know what's actually happening. So when there's a problem, if you don't know what's happening, how do you fix the problem? See what I mean? Yes, I do. So my work consists mostly of helping people to become aware of these communication issues, first of all. Mm -hmm. To become aware of what is cultural about how they do it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then to be perhaps more accepting of the cultural, I like to use the metaphor of a dance. This is all what I call sort of the dance of communication. And so other cultures may dance differently, but it doesn't, you don't have to have a negative opinion about that. You can just say, ah, you know, that's a different dance than mine. Uh, Equally as good. Let's see how we can build a bridge between our two different communication styles. So that's where I teach people then specific communication skills because it, you can teach people how to communicate effect, more effectively. I mean, we all communicate well enough. I'm not here to say that nobody knows how to communicate. We all do, and we're all good enough. But when something goes wrong, we don't know what to do. So once you have some communication skills, you have some possibility for troubleshooting the situation. And also, once you understand what intercultural communication is and what the particular challenges of that are, then also you can be the person helping solve the problem not creating more problems right i see right so so what kind of problems can be caused by um a lack of intercultural communication skills a lot of it is actually emotional strangely enough Mm. um Because, I mean, when we think of communication problems, we think of, you know, somebody said something wrong and we're fixing how they said it and we're trying to get clear about what they said. But what happens a lot is that, you know, when there's a misinterpretation, so when you're listening with cultural ears and somebody says something to you and you think to yourself, well, that was rude or that was, you know, very insulting or that wasn't, that's not the way to say that to me. They could have said it some other way, right? And mm-hmm. you're saying all these things to yourself as you're listening. Immediately, you're emotionally triggered. Mm. And so there's a level of frustration and upset and misunderstanding that can happen in those moments where you know, you yourself think it's the other person causing it. But in fact, what's happening is your cultural, um, your cultural codes are being breached. So again, if you want a concrete example, I'll show you some, tell you about something very concretely. Mm. There was a Spanish guy that I was, uh, had as a client here in the south of France. I, I have a lot of clients in the uh, Technopole called Sophie Antipolis, where there are... Um, a uh, wide range of uh, hundreds of com- uh, companies, and the cultures range from 83 different co- uh, c- countries. Wow. So that's quite surprising when you think about it, right? A real sort of intercultural milieu. Mm. And this this particular client who was um, in the IT field came from Spain, and he had just arrived, and he'd been here for a few months, and he was saying that he really missed Spain because he said in Spain there's a real kind of connectedness 
that happens. People spend a lot of time together, you know, they exchange and everything. He was finding that, you know, in, in this area of the world, he was feeling a little bit isolated. And he was working for an American manager. And uh, he went to his American manager one day to discuss some problems he was having and wanted to have discussion. And he went to the guy's uh, office, knocked on his door, and said, oh, can I have a, a discussion with you about a problem, some problems I'm encountering? And the American said to me, oh, send me an email. Right? Mm. So, <laughs> so there's a communication, right? Now, what's wrong with that communication? From the American standpoint, nothing. But from the listener standpoint, I mean, this is a guy who immediately got frustrated and annoyed and basically said, well, I can't get along with my American manager. And that happened out of one sentence. Send me an email. Send me an email. And, you know, to some other culture, in some other context, that would have not been the wrong communication. And was the American guy being indifferent or... You know, mean? No, he was just being American. I mean, you know, somewhere in his culture and his way of being, that seemed more efficient. And maybe once the email had been sent, he might, you know, set up a meeting with the guy or something. Sorry, what was the problem uh, that the Spanish guy had with being told to well, send to? The point was, he felt. I, I prefaced it by saying that he's a guy who values connection. Right. So to him, he was his cultural value of connection. And, I mean, if it had been, per, I don't know the Spanish context, but I could imagine that in a Spanish context, the manager would have stopped, you know, they would have gone for a coffee, mm-hmm. they would have sat down and discussed the situation, you know? Mm. I mean, I don't know, I'm speculating. Yeah. So I don't know what the Spanish dance is, but I'm telling you that in that kind of a concrete example, it's not what happened that's the problem, it's how the person interprets it. And once they interpret... Uh, Once they get frustrated or annoyed or upset with a person from another culture, they shut down somewhere the communication. They're not as open to the communication. And if you're not open to a communication, how are you going to dance well together? See what I mean? Mm, Yes, exactly. So this is a small example and seems insignificant, but I tell you, I, I hear these kinds of stories a million times a day with my clients and in workshops, and they seem really insignificant, but they're not insignificant on a cultural level. I suppose they're indicative of um, something like a relationship kind of breaking down. That yeah, exactly. It's, it's yeah. little details, little moments like that, which together uh, cause a relationship to, to go wrong or to go badly. And it's just because yeah. people aren't communicating along on the same wavelength. Well, yeah, because they're communicating on cultural autopilot. This is the real breakdown in intercultural context is that everybody is functioning from their own, as I said, their own sort of style, tone, values, way they actually formulate their sentences. Mm. That is all really conditioned into us and we're not even aware of it. So, Right now, I'm sort of featuring a little bit the things that can go wrong. And, uh, you know, they can go even more wrong in the sense of, you know, there's deadlines missed and, you know, people don't respond to emails. And I mean, there's a countless, you know, other issues that are much bigger than what I just said. But they all result ultimately in individuals feeling uh, adding to their stress, to their frustration, to their, you know, anger at each other. Mm. And all of that creates a mistrust and, and creates a um, sort of a bad coordination of action. Because for me, that's fundamentally what communication is, coordinating action. Yeah, like a dance. Yeah, dance. yeah like a dance. And if you don't know how to coordinate action uh, effectively, we all do it well enough, but I'm a kind of optimalist person. I'm always saying, how can we optimize what we're doing? And that's really what I focus on in my, in my workshops, is how can we optimize coordination of action through language? So how could so, this Spanish guy, I mean, what, what would you tell the Spanish guy? What would you try to help him to realize or do to deal with that situation? To answer the question, I'd like to give you another sort of a bigger context. Mm. Because one of the things, again, to go back to the idea of what is communication, uh, when you look at this example I just gave you, and if you try to troubleshoot it, you don't really know what to look at. 
So I gave you some parameters around, you know, cultural values and all of that. But we can't really see the mechanics of what's going on there. So what I teach people uh, in my, all my courses and one-on-one is what I call the universal language. And the purpose of teaching people that is to simplify intercultural communication. Because if, if for example, I answered your question and I said, well, the Spanish are this way and, mm. you know, this what, why they, he reacted this way, and I gave you a lot of reasons, um, that might be fine for that situation, but does that extrapolate to all Spanish people? Who knows, right? Mm. Or imagine in the USBC, um, HSBC example I gave you, 18 different cultures. Can you possibly learn about <laughs> everything that's different about 18 different cultures? Bah. No, I mean, it's impossible. Mm. So it's far too complex. So what I help people do is to simplify it. So what is the universal language? What is common to everybody? If you shift your perspective to how we're all the same rather than how we're different, Mm. it really simplifies things. So do you want to know what the universal language is? Yes, please. (laughs) That's the response I get in my workshops. (laughs) I pose that question and everybody is like suddenly listening to me. You know, nobody's distracted. Tell us what it is. (laughs) <laughs> and here's the other interesting thing about the universal language is everybody already knows it. They use it all the time and they have no idea that they know. So what I'm about to tell you will be obvious once I say it. So in all communication, there is only five things that happen. So regardless of your culture, regardless of your profession, regardless of your age, whether you're a man or a woman, uh, Regardless of anything about you, you do exactly the same thing as everybody else. You communicate only in five ways, and those five ways are these. First, you make requests. You ask for what you want or need. Mm -hmm. Second thing you do is make offers. So you offer what somebody else wants or needs. When you fulfill a request or an offer, it's called a promise. Okay? Yeah. That's the third one. The fourth one is opinions. You express your opinions with or without facts. Mm-hmm. And the fifth one is declarations. And that's the, the one that's the least known and understood. But just to say briefly, declarations are visions for the future or desires for the future. Okay? Okay. So those are basically the fundamentals of communication. The problem is, no, so we all know how to do that. So even before, uh, just to give you an example of how it's already wired into us, if you have children or you see children or, you know, you remember what it was like when you were a child, Mm. even before language, when you wanted something, you grabbed it or you went for it or you moved toward it. That's a human impulse to go toward what we want. So every time we make a request, we are going toward what we want. So to use the example of the Spanish guy, the Spanish guy was making a request, talk to me, mm. right? The, uh, the manager was making a request, send me an email. Yeah. So really all that was happening there is there were two requests. So what could have changed in the domain of a request? Like the way in which it's put, the way in which it's worded, um, potentially. I mean, I'm thinking of language again, but... Um... Yeah. Perhaps, but again, that's cultural. So a French person might have said, oh, if you don't mind, I'm right busy right now, but you know, if you call me back later, maybe I'll be able to talk to you. Or they would say nothing or whatever, right? So they would have responded in their own cultural way. But if you forget that there's a cultural way and you just realize that it's two requests. Mm. So if that Spanish guy had taken a course with me, he would have gone, ah, okay, the manager's making a request. Will, will I agree to his request or will I make another request? So he could have said, well, okay, you've asked me to, to send you an email. I prefer to talk to you now, for example, mm. right? Yeah. That would have been a way to get what he, the Spanish guy, needed. That's what I call in English a counter offer. So uh, um, cultures are trained to be either more request oriented or more offer oriented. That's another issue around speech acts. Mm. And when, for example, Americans, North Americans in general and Anglophones in general are conditioned to be more request oriented. 
we ask for what we want easily, repeatedly, you know, the famous American saying is never take no for an answer, right? <laughs> so that's how we're conditioned. That's how we function in life. Other cultures like Spanish, you know, French, even some of the Eastern cultures and things like that, they're conditioned to be more offer oriented. They observe what somebody wants or needs and they offer it. So they're better at making offers than at making requests and vice versa. So the interesting phenomenon was that when I was giving workshops in North America, I was teaching Americans how to be better at making, giving offers or making offers. And now that I'm in France, I teach Europeans and Asians and people of those cultures how to make requests. Because to be a good communicator, you have to be equally good at both. And I've rarely encountered people who are equally competent in both speech acts. So that's a big aspect. So what I would teach that Spanish guy is to become very good at making requests, even more clearly and more repeatedly, and also making a counteroffer just because somebody, you know, because he listened to the guy's request as a no. Yeah. So if you say no to somebody, how do you respond? If somebody says no to you, how do you respond? Again, how you respond is very culturally conditioned. We have no idea that that's so. I mean, we can train ourselves to go beyond our cultural conditioning, mm. but very few people do that. So if you've been taught repeatedly in your culture that when somebody says no to you, you obey, yeah. that's how you're going to function in intercultural context. Can I give an example? Sorry, can I give an example here? Maybe you can comment on it. So uh, I've, I've mentioned this example before that as an English person living in mm -hmm. Paris, I do sort of struggle sometimes, not just with the language, but generally with the, the whole approach to certain situations. And um, there is a, it's kind of a cliche, but it's sort of true as well that uh, in France, no, like people say no a lot more easily than they do back home in England. Um, whereas in England, you know, it's like more, more, more of a sort of affirmative culture where we'll kind of like, yeah, yeah, we should be able to do that. Kind of everything's a bit more positive, sounds more positive at the beginning. Uh, in France, I find that things can be a bit like, oh, no, that's going to be difficult. Oh, no, like that's not possible. And you're, what you're supposed to do is, is, is wait, basically, and just kind of maintain and keep going, well, really, there's nothing you can do, or is this a very difficult situation? Oh, this is tricky. And you wait until eventually they come round to say yes. But me, as an English person, I'll go to the restaurant and I'll ask the waiter, uh, do you have a table for two? And they'll say, no, sorry. And I'll go, right, well, thanks very much, bye. Um, and then I go to my wife, who's French, and I say to her, oh, yeah, sorry, they're full. And she'll be like, wait a minute. And then she goes in, and she'll speak to the same waiter. And then and I'm standing there going, there's no way she's going to get a table. And she maintains the conversation and then comes back out and says, oh, we've got a table. Come in. Come on. Let's go and sit down. We'll, uh, we'll order our food straight away. I'm like, how did she do that? So, uh, well, then, with yeah. your question has many, many elements to it, so I'll try to answer some of them. Okay. So the first, the first thing is that um, Anglophones tend to have an attitude in requests where they are very thinking of themselves. So you go in and you want a table and everything about you says, this is what I want. Mm -hmm. Okay. The minute you do that with a French person, they're sort of like, a distance created because you're not taking them into account. So when your wife goes in there, the, what the person experiences is that. The experience is that connection that she's making with them. She's regarding them at the same time that she's trying to get what she wants. Right. And so the French have this very interesting dance where their request is almost formulated like an offer. You know, there's, yeah. it's actually exists yeah. in the French form. And when they try to do that in English, it's very confusing to other cultures because they don't they don't understand the phenomenon. So it's a very complex dance that even I who have lived in France for a long time and I observed the French and I try to use it can't always get it right because it doesn't just have to do with the words you're using and the form of the request. It has to do with the degree of politeness, the kind of vocabulary you're using in, in relation to the mm. cultural status of the person you're talking to. I mean, it has a sense of humor to it. I mean, it's very, very complex. And that's why she can get what she wants in those contexts and you can't because you don't know the dance. <laughs> And probably never will, as I never will, because of anglophones, we can't master it. <laughs> so, so what's the difference between my dance and my wife's dance, then? 
It's not French. <laughs> But what is the, I mean, like, like you talked about and how... It, how so I would say it's more request-oriented and not offer-oriented. So how would I make my request of a table more like an offer then? I mean, what, what sort of... Is this where we start to get into specifics of language? This is where you get into specifics of your attitude and your competence. You may actually not be that, I don't know you well, so I'm saying this in a very speculative way, but you may actually not be very good at offering. I'm a deeply incompetent man, (laughs) especially (laughs) especially in France. But but in that particular speech act, you don't have the skills and all the things that you need. So, for example, let me just dissect an offer. What is an offer? An offer is that you're observing the other person and you're looking at what is their problem. So, for example, you walk into a busy restaurant and the guy you're, you're talking to, you're about to ask something from, is hugely distracted. So you could say to them, oh, I see you're very busy. I can see that, uh, you know, this is difficult for you. Is this a good time to, uh, I'd like to find out if it's possible to get a table. Is this a good time for you? Yeah. See the orientation? You walk in and say, hi, I want a table. Yeah. Do you see the difference? Yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 So it's not in what you say. It's in your, your um, attitude that is in a way cultural because Anglophones and North Americans are really cult- culturally conditioned to in a kind of me first attitude. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't be offer-oriented and that we're not good with other people, but our basic way of functioning in life is me, <laughs> mm. whereas the basic way of functioning for the French is other. You know, for example, the French have a really negative opinion about people who are very request-oriented consistently. They call them egotistical, right? Yeah. In North yeah. America, we call them you know, normal. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. So, and it's very difficult for, for somebody who's conditioned totally to be other oriented or sorry, to make requests and vice versa. You make them, but you make them with a different attitude and it, and it creates a different result depending on how the person is interpreting it. So I'm not saying what I'm about to say isn't perhaps true, but I'm going to take it to the extreme. It's possible that the minute you say that to that guy, that guy has a judgment of you as egotistical, and at that moment, he's closed the door on you. Also, <laughs> because I do it in my crappy... Um, no, uh, it's in, not crappy. In... You do it in your British dance. Yeah. There's nothing right or wrong about it is the British dance. But so- it's not sometimes i feel like when i let's say make a request in france or i just do something i go into a shop and even open my mouth and say bonjour then they immediately categorize me as a non-french speaker and i'm probably a tourist in their eyes and then you know the relationship is is being completely changed whereas when my wife goes in and what her approach is probably uh, all the things that you've been saying so she will probably say yeah, look we're going to be really quick we already know what we want to order we you know we'll just be straight in and straight out we're not going to cause you any trouble don't yeah, worry exactly. i understand that you're busy but we're <laughs> going to be you know like we we don't mind sitting in this uh, that table there we, you know we're not going to cause you any trouble that's probably yeah. like what she's telling them and then they're like well okay i'll speak to the chef and then it's like yeah, okay in that case come in and see, even when you were doing that, like, kind of like, you know, sort of scenario as pretending that you could do that, you're s- sort of doing it tongue in cheek. You see, you can't you that makes no sense. You know, you do it, but somewhere you'd be mocking yourself and the other person for doing that Maybe. because it's not your culture. It's not your dance. Yeah. So and, but, and the scenario you've just described, you know, is exactly what people in intercultural ex- context experience every day, not just with the French, but with the Germans and the Spanish and the Italians and the British and the Americans and the Canadians and the Algerians and blah, 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 Mm -hmm. Chinese and Japanese, whatever. You see, so that, do you see how that one little thing that seems totally insignificant is actually uh, sort of um, based in speech acts? So, for example, what's the solution to that? Mm. What I teach everybody in my intercultural context is to ignore everything about the request except the content. So ignore the tone, ignore the body language, ignore the form, 
identify the speech act. Oh, that person. So imagine the waiter or the the guy, the maitre d in the um, in the in the restaurant said, "Oh, he's British, so he's making a request in a British way." Okay, fine. I get that it's a request. It's not the way I'd make a request, but okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's what I teach people to do. I teach them to identify the speech act. Okay, that's a con- that's a request. Fine. That's a offer. Fine. That's a promise. Fine. It doesn't have to be right in my cultural standard. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. to coordinate action, truly, all you need to do is identify the speech act. And in fact, even in our own cultures, if we learn to do that, we eliminate a lot of problems because mostly what we're reacting to when we're angry about a request or we don't want to meet a request or we don't want to offer or we don't want to give our opinions, mostly we're doing that because somewhere we've interpreted the other person as being wrong. Right. And the minute you do that, you've closed communication. There's no way to have good communication between two people who consider each other wrong. Mm, mm. Do you have any more specific examples? Like, for example, um, what is the most sort of common issue that you notice in terms of people kind of lacking the intercultural communication skills? Well, again, it's mostly it's it's just to recognize that uh, because most people are reacting not to the speech act, but to the form and the content. Right. Uh, sorry, the form and the tone and the style. So what I teach people to do is to ignore all of that. But another example that I can give you more concretely, which which maybe gives you more of a sense of style and a bit, a bit more complicated. Again, I'll use the French and, and American example. I don't know if the British are quite like this, but I can use the American and French examples. I know North Americans better than I know the British. Yeah. Um, so, for example, expressing an opinion in English. How do you do that? Well, if you're American, there's a very particular sort of way that you do it. And usually what characterizes an an American way of expressing an opinion is it's usually very brief. It's very direct. There's very few facts to ground the opinion. You know, if you're an expert in your field in business and you have an opinion, people pretty much say, okay, he knows what he or she knows what they're talking about and they don't necessarily need facts. And if you look at how a French person expresses an opinion, it's totally different. And one of the interesting phenomenons in France is that because there's a national educational system, all the French have learned learned to communicate in in the same way. And it's what they call in French the argumentation style. That doesn't really translate in English, but in English it's called argumentation. In English it would be called line of reasoning. So when you really look at how a French person expresses their opinion, they've all learned first to give you the context. So, for example, you ask a French person, so where did you go on holidays this year? And they start by the context. Well, normally every year we go to blah, 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 but this year we decided to go la, 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 la. So there's the context, the Mm -hmm. historical context. Then they give you the the current context. And it wasn't that easy to get away this year because my son had this to do and that to do and my husband had extra work and blah, blah. So that's the current context. And then they tell you, you know, where they went. And they give you lots and lots and lots and lots of facts Mm-hmm. with lots of different tonalities. And the tonality tells you whether they liked it, didn't like it, you know, it was okay, not so okay. The French are real masterful at tonality. What they, kind of, what, what, I'm sorry, what kind of tonalities sorry. do you mean? Well, you know, but it's very subtle, too. If you're not French, it's really hard to hear it sometimes. Mm. Because in just the way their tonality or their facial expression, they can tell you if they like or don't like something, but they don't explicitly say that. It's implicit in the tone. Okay. And it's part of what makes it difficult for other cultures to understand their opinions. So they've learned this style and they communicate with this tonality and nuances and and they're not at all black and white, they're very shades of gray, whereas anglophones tend to be very black and white. Mm -hmm. So when they're communicating with each other and exchanging opinions, often a French person, this is what practically every French person I've ever trained can relate to this comment. At some point when they're talking, some other culture will say to them, what is your point? And and the French are always baffled by that because they've just been giving you their point for like the last 20 minutes. Why haven't you heard it? It must be you who's not listening, right? (laughs) Because they don't realize that their 
their communication is quite implicit. So when I work with the French, I teach them to be more explicit. And it's not easy to do because they've learned that style. And, and it, it takes some, you know, practice and effort on their part to actually learn how to speak in a black and white way and to be explicit when they need to with other cultures. So that maybe answers your question about, you know, specifically how style and form between cultures can create uh, maybe not communication problems, but there's a lack of clarity in the communication. Okay. I would say that that's really, really for me, I mean, when I say I create clear and confident intercultural communicators, for me, it's about clarity. I teach people how to be clear about what it is they want to communicate and then how to structure it as simply as possible and as explicitly as possible so people from any culture at any level of English can understand it. Right, very good. Now, you've Makes written sense. a book, if uh, my listeners want to know more. Uh, can you tell us about your book? It's an e-book, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's an e-book. It's called The Dance of Opinions. <laughs> yeah. And it really goes into um, how to... Um, uh, it, it features a lot of the things I've been talking about in the bot- podcast, just to have an understanding of different aspects of intercultural communication. And um, but it's primarily focused on how do you express opinions, because that's something that I find a lot of my clients want to know how to do. And it's a lot of um, people who use English as a second language. It's one of the he- things I hear all about. I hear often is that. People say, well, I can't be as convincing in English as I am in my native language. Mm. And they think that's a vocabulary and grammar issue. But often it's a form issue. They don't know how to create a, how to structure what they want to say. And it's also a lack of not being able to be clear about what they want to say. So something I teach people to do and what I, what I say about communication is clarity happens before you speak or write. Most of us start speaking, and we get clear as we're speaking, mm. and we want listeners to listen to that until we're clear, <laughs> right? But by that point, they stop listening because, you know, they didn't understand what we're saying, so they've gone, they're thinking about something else. Or we start writing, and we have no idea what we want to write. Yes. So, yes. That, so I teach people processes about how to identify uh, what they're, what is it really that they want to communicate, and then how to structure it. So again, as, as I say, in an intercultural context, it needs to be simple and concise and explicit, because not because that's the right way to do it, but in an intercultural context, it's the easiest for everybody. Because whether you're Russian or you know, German or American or you know, French using English, the simpler the English is, the better you will understand what the message is. That's very interesting because I imagine a lot of people will assume that um, it's better if they're speaking English to speak in a sort of fairly complicated way with some um, uh, high-level vocab and complicated long sentences. But when you get down to just doing business, sometimes that doesn't help. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, Sad to say, but Anglophones are the worst offenders of that. Uh We never dumb down our English in intercultural context, and we should. Right, yes, absolutely. I've I've often thought that, that we need to teach, um, let's say, English people or English native speakers how to speak English as a second language. Well, yeah, and we or at least we need to be aware that when we're in intercultural context, we need to... You know, again, it forces us to change our habits, but we we have to, you know, be aware that we need to speak simpler. Yeah. And um, one of the best compliments I get sometimes from my clients who are using English as a second language, they'll often come back to me and say, you know, I, I have these Anglophone clients I work with or colleagues I work with, and now I realize what bad communicators they are. <laughs> yeah. As before working with me, they thought it was their English skills, you see. Yes. But afterwards, they were, so just because you speak a Eng- uh, language well doesn't mean that you can communicate well. So once you learn communication, you can see that even native speakers, you know, could learn a few things about 
how to improve their communication skills. It's very interesting. Right. Pe- people are often um, sort of, what's the word for it, um, uh, fascinated by the fact that they can understand everything I say and that they understand me really, really easily. But when it comes to talking to other native speakers of English, they don't understand them as well. And I'm kind of often thinking, what am I doing? Am I speaking really slowly? I don't think so. I speak quite quickly. I think it must be that I've just got communication skills after being an English language teacher for nearly 20 years. And so that I've just learned how to think about the other person, try and talk in a way that they understand. So I'm just good at communicating. It's more that than than just like yeah, the speed exactly. of my speech. Yeah. And you also articulate very well. So mm. when one articulates words, um, people who are, um, you know, not native English speakers can understand the words. I mean, I always tell, you know, people who are using English as a second language, don't worry about complex verb forms. You know, learn to speak and write in the three basic simple past, present and future and you you simplify your life because you don't – complex verb forms are lovely and great when if you're doing literature or something like that. Mm. In day-to-day, coordination of action are really not that useful. So, again, I, as I say, I'd like to have people focus on what they can change, not on what they can't change. Yes, yes. Yep. It's interesting, yes. that, isn't it? Because like people, when, they, when they're learning English, they assume – that they have to learn the most complex, the most sort of literary yeah. uh, version. But in fact, sometimes it's about learning how to use English as a tool. And that just means yeah. often keeping it as simple as possible. Although I suppose, like, you know, it's an identity issue as well, isn't it? Because some people don't want to come across as being a bit basic and simple. They want to sound sophisticated and complex. So it's, it's yeah, that's complex. also Yeah, that's also cultural, you see. Yeah. So that's not something Americans care about or North Americans in general, whereas <laughs> maybe British people care about that. The French care about that a lot. Yes. And, the, and when the French say to me, you know, my English is awful, I say, no, it's not awful. It's actually pretty good. But to their ear, it's not sophisticated enough. It's not complex enough. Yeah. And, and for North Americans, it doesn't need to be because we don't expect that or, or judge that. Yeah. You know, in fact, time is money. So the less you say and the faster you say it, the happier we are. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, yeah, um, so. you, you talked about approaches to communication. What, um, and in your book, it's about what did you say it was about again? What's the main focus? The main focus is how to uh, learn how Opinion. to express your opinions. Expressing and opinions. there's uh, expressing opinions. And I have a five-step structure mm. that I teach people how to, to use that can be utilized for doing presentations, in meetings, even writing emails or reports. So it's basically a very simple structure that's easy to learn, easy to apply, and uh, and you know, when they do that, they're more easily understood. Uh, if you want an example of that, I had a client in Marseille who uh, was a, um, he had a, two PhDs in environmental sciences. He was incredibly uh, um, versed in that topic. And when he'd go to international conferences uh, and he'd stand up at a mic and he'd talk about his ideas and theories. And when I met him, he said, you know, I don't know why, but I go to these conferences and nobody ever comes up and talks to me later or, mm. you know, asks any questions. I feel totally useless. It must be my English. Well, no, it wasn't his English. His English was already pretty good. But he talked in that kind of, you know, form I just t- told you earlier about how the French speak. You know, he went on and on. Very lots of details, very implicit, nothing explicit. And once he learned my five-step method, he was going to these conferences, and while he was sitting in the you know the audience, he'd be jotting down what he wanted to say in that structure, and he'd stand up to the mic and say it. And afterwards, he said he got so much response. People would come up and talk to him and ask him questions and stuff, and whatever. Uh, Sherwin, so sorry, why? sorry I've, um, the plumber has arrived. I'm just going to go and okay. let him in, okay? So okay. just hold that thought. We'll carry on in a couple of minutes. I'm going to have to leave you, but I'll be back uh, straight That's away. Fine. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. Okay, no problem. So where do you want me to pick? Up? Um, uh, so you were saying you were talking about your uh, client who is an academic who uh, goes to conferences. He talks and no one comes up to him afterwards, and he's certain that it, that it's his English. Yeah. So he, so what I taught him was this five step structure, 
that once you learn how to use it, you can use it very quickly, you know. So as I was saying that he, um, you know, even when he's at a conference, as he's deciding what he wants to say, he quickly, you know, jots down ideas using that structure, gets up to the mic and uses that structure, and then people respond to him. Why do they respond? Is his English improved? No. He's easier to understand. Mm. And if people understand you, <laughs> they'll ask questions. You know, they'll, mm. they'll relate to you. They'll start to speak to you. If they have no idea what you're saying, I mean, you know, nobody's going to come up to you and say, you know, I think you have some great ideas, but I didn't understand a thing you said. So can you sort of, you know, tell me what it is I should know? <laughs> mm. You know, no, that question, we just sort of avoid the whole situation. And unfortunately, that happens a lot to people who don't use English as a second language. They have a lot to contribute in terms of their opinions and perspectives, but they don't know how to package them in a way that people from other cultures get it. So my book is really dedicated to that. How do you package your professional opinions in a way that it transmits easily to other people so that they can benefit from it, essentially? Sounds good. So that's, yeah, so that's essentially what the book's about, and you can purchase it on Amazon, any of the Amazons, in fact, and it's only around, you know, nine, ten euros, something like that. Yeah. So that will teach you, and I mean, it's a, I, I formulated it, and I created the book in such a way that it's almost like a communication uh, coach on your desk, you know, you, or on your laptop. And the last two um, chapters are questions, hundreds of questions, that when you're actually working on a communication issue, uh, you, those questions prompt you to utilize what you already learned in the book. So it's kind of a, you know, a no-brainer in a sense. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you can just yeah. go all of the, the lines. Also, I have a website, SherwoodFleming.com, mm -hmm. where there's 60 articles about intercultural communication. So if people want to read some of the things we discussed about some of the things we discussed today, they can find it there. And they can even download a sample chapter of the book if they want to read all about it. Okay, fantastic. What about if people want to work with you? If, if for example, people are interested in... Um, uh, getting your help with improving their intercultural communication skills or the skills of the people of you know their colleagues at work is that a thing that you can do too sure sure they can always send me an email at s fleming at sherwoodfleming.com it's yeah. fleming with one m uh -huh. so s S Fleming at SherwoodFleming.com and just send me a request. And um, I do work with people by Skype as well as in person. I also give workshops, one and two day workshops. And so, yeah, there's a lot of different formats that I can use to help people. I just have to make that request to you in the, in the right way. Well, they can make the request in any way they want. I'll understand it's a request. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how to decode yeah. it. Yeah, and then the interesting thing is, is when you just listen to communication, when you learn, when you train yourself to just I, to listen for the speech act, mm -hmm. it removes a lot of uh, emotion, uh, negative emotion to the communication exchange. Because usually, what we're responding to negatively isn't the content; it's all those cultural things that we've embodied, and we don't have a choice. We've embodied them. We can't change them. We are that way. We're always probably going to be that way. And so, you know, it's a matter of just accepting each other as we are, you know. Mm. So that's really a big message in my workshops is just to, you know, realize that we all use the universal language. We're all the same in that way. And if we just stay focused on that, a lot of the problems dissolve. Yeah. So it's really not that difficult. <laughs> that's, yeah, it's rather beautiful, really. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, well, Sherwood Fleming, thank you very much for talking to me on the podcast. It's been uh, very interesting. And, uh, yeah, uh -huh. have, a, have a lovely day down there in the south of France. Well, thanks very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Luke. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, cheers. Bye-bye. So thanks again to Sherwood Fleming for being on the podcast today. That was a very interesting conversation about the way we all communicate with each other in different ways. So, conclusions... Well, I think it sort of boils down to this. Uh, keep it simple. So basically, make explicit what you want and what you're offering. So dumb down your English in intercultural contexts, which is quite surprising because normally we imagine that you'd have to 
be more complex in your, in your English to show how great you are. But actually, sometimes it's better to keep it as simple as possible. Focus on the main message, the speech act, uh, rather than the form of the message. Some cultures don't emphasize things that other cultures expect. But the main thing is to focus on specifically what the other person wants rather than how they're saying or writing it. So thanks for all your recent comments and emails and stuff. It's great to hear from you. Um, And so here, in fact, are some choice comments from the last few episodes. So here's a comment from Tatiana. And this is 18 hours ago from the moment I'm recording this. And uh, she wrote this. Luke, I've just binged all three episodes with quintessentially British things. And I must say that they're brilliant. You're so blessed to have such an interesting and intellectual family of yours. All the three episodes are completely different and amazing to listen to. It's like I've looked at Britain that I've never known before. So hats off to you and your beautiful kin. And kin means family. That's very nice. Thank you, Tatiana. I've had various comments and messages about episodes with members of my family. I was talking about um, doing something like Mum's Book Club. And I had various people writing to me about, um, you know, episodes with my mum. And by the way, listeners, lots of people were writing mum, M-O-M. And that's the American version. And in the UK, in British English, it's M-U-M. So uh, when, when you're writing M-O-M, it's, it's like mom, you know, like the American mom. Uh, but in uh, British English, it's mum, which is M-U-M. So um, there have been numerous requests for episodes of Jill's Book Club, as it might be called, or Jill's Culture Club or something. So we're looking at doing episodes of that sometimes. There's also a Rick Thompson report on the way soon. I've had messages thanking me for the recent episode about IELTS with Keith O'Hare and uh, have asked for more, so I might do something in the near future. Here's a comment from Uswa, and this is actually four hours ago. Uh, Hi Luke, I'm Uswa from Indonesia. I've been thinking about giving a comment in each episode, particularly every time Amber and Paul are on the podcast. However, I always uh, feel unsure until today I heard the fact that there are fewer comments and responses from your listeners. So here I am now. I want uh, I want you to know that I'm a faithful listener. I get every joke you make, including Russian jokes and the Lion King. Lol. I laugh out loud when three of you when the three of you are laughing. I'm an English teacher basically, but I spend most of my time sewing. So uh, actually, I'm a tailor, but not Paul Taylor. Lol. Huh. Uh, by the way, listeners, you know sewing. That's when you've got like a needle and a thread, and you're sewing. So it could be like making clothes, and a tailor is someone who makes clothes. So yes, yeah, so he's uh, this. Uh, I don't know who this person is, but uh, the usware if that's a boy or a girl. But anyway, uh, not uh, a tailor, but not Paul Taylor. So anyway. I've I've always been I've always listened uh, I've always enjoyed listening to your podcast when I'm sewing. It's just so fun. So I feel my sewing project is much more fun since that's the time I listen to your podcast. So keep up the good work, Luke. And I'm looking forward to having Amber and Paul again. All right, nice one. And this is a final comment from Enri- Enrico, uh, 21 hours ago, and Enrico said, "So this is um." Yeah, in response to one of the Amber and Paul episodes recently, he said, so let me recap. Last May, Luke published an episode titled Sleep with Amber and Paul. Now, eight months later, Amber is heavily pregnant. These guys are bringing the concept of modern family to a whole new level. Uh, (laughs) um, Excellent comment. That's got to be comment of the week. What comment of the month? I need to set up something like that, don't I? Comment of the week, comment of the month. I mean... I don't know if I can do it on a weekly basis, but maybe I can just kind of nominally call it comment of the week and it's just sort of a comment of the moment or comment of the moment. I don't know. Flavor of the month, comment of the month, something like that. But there it is, Enrico. Last May, Luke published an episode called Sleep with Amber and Paul. Eight months later, Amber is heavily pregnant. These guys are bringing the concept of modern family to a whole new level. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Enrico. Yeah. 
huge crowd of people all applauding uh, their excellent comments. Uh, so that's it for this episode. I'll speak to you again on the podcast soon. Take care out there, okay? Until next time, goodbye. Bye. 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 for listening to Luke's English podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.